This is the Kiev Post Top Stories podcast. I'm the Kiev Post news editor, Ewan MacDonald, and this is our first feature, Lives Held Captive. Part 1. Anonymous Message. Hi. The message just read, hi. What would you make of such a message from a complete stranger? For some reason, Nina Kodman was practically petrified when she got this message on Russian social network Vkontakte. The account belonged to a young man from Russia whom she had never met. Nina is a native of Ternopil, western Ukraine, some 1,500 kilometers away from Russia. She looked at the message again and deleted it. But she couldn't get it out of her mind, and she had reason to worry. She hadn't heard from her elder brother, Alexei, for a couple of days. He was serving as a soldier with the 56th Brigade at the front lines near the Azov seaport of city of Mariupol. However, quite often soldiers are not allowed to take phones with them while on missions so that the enemy can't track them. But when the next day Nina received another message reading hi from another unknown account, her heart dropped. She contacted the army enlistment office, but they didn't tell her anything useful. Then she contacted volunteers. They promised to help. Days later, Nina received something that made her blood run cold. It was a video entitled Hello from Donetsk. When she played it, she saw her brother with two other soldiers on the central square of Russian-occupied Donetsk. Alexei had been captured by Russian-led forces. Part 2. Another Sister Around a thousand kilometers from Ternopil, in the budget resort city of Berpiansk on the Azov Sea, another sister was watching her brother in the same video. Alyona Iovova already knew that Russian-led forces had captured her brother Nikola. She had learned it almost by chance when she received a phone call from her brother's partner, with whom she rarely spoke. The woman's message was short and blunt. They've got your brother. Alexei and Mikola would never have met if they had not been for war. The two men, filmed bruised and exhausted on Lenin Square in Donetsk, had very different stories. Alexei used to work as a firefighter in his native Ternopil, but then had to move abroad to help raise money for medical treatment for his mother. He has a round, almost childish-looking face, with puffy lips and kind eyes. Alexei was drafted as soon as he returned to Ukraine. His mother cried and begged him not to go to war, but he did. Mikola joined the armed forces as a volunteer because he thought this would prevent his younger brother, who had congenital disease, from being drafted. It didn't work. The army took both brothers. Aliona shows Mikola's picture on her phone without moving a muscle. She hasn't seen him for more than two years, but in the picture, it seems he's right there. A dark-haired man with a beard, sharp facial features and stern eyes. It's hard to believe when Aliona says her brother jokes a lot and likes to draw cartoons for her little daughter. Aliona didn't expect any help from the state or the army, so she started knocking on doors by herself. She called local journalists and activists she knew. She filed reports with the police and the State Security Service, or SBU. Several days later, she had a small glimmer of hope. A stranger contacted her and asked her to get him in touch with the SBU. Told her that the Russians wanted to exchange her brother and several other captors for a young woman who had allegedly spied for Russian-led forces and who had been detained. Determined, Aliona went to the local SBU official. But he only shouted at her for being in touch with someone in Russian-occupied Donetsk. No exchange happened and both Alexei and Mikola remained in prison. Part 3. Time to act. It was up to the families themselves. They found all of the information about their captive loved ones on their own by asking volunteers, acquaintances, and making numerous calls and sending letters to officials. They wrote to everyone they could think of, including Pope Francis, US President Donald Trump, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and Queen Elizabeth. Alexei's father, Serhii, organized several rallies in Ternopil and Kyiv. Eventually, the family was invited to Kyiv to meet with some senior military officials. 
Alexei's father was full of hope when he travelled to the capital. He thought it meant that his son might be released soon. He returned home devastated. The meeting was full of empty promises and it didn't seem like the captured soldiers would be back any time soon. But they didn't want to give up. The families of the captured soldiers united to tackle the officials together. They both had the same problems, the state's inertia, the lack of information, and the fact that the captive soldiers couldn't even be legally termed prisoners of war. Since Ukraine officially called the war in eastern Ukraine an anti-terrorist operation, those who were captured are not officially recognised to be prisoners of war. The only way to contact the captors was through the Red Cross, who were occasionally able to deliver parcels and letters to the separatist prisons. But there were no guarantees that Alexei or Mikola would get them. Alexei's father continued to attend rallies in support of the captives. There, he usually held a poster with a photo of his son and the number of days he had been in captivity. The father kept all of the posters in one folder, calling it his visual diary. It was a terrible reminder of his son's fate as the numbers grew and grew. But one day, there was some new hope. They learned that there was to be a prisoner exchange. As they discovered later, Alexei and Mikola were being taken by car to the contact line between government-controlled and Russian-occupied territories. Both families were bursting with excitement. They had been through so much. It had already been almost two years since Alexei and Mikola had left home. But something happened and the car returned to the prison. There was no exchange. And the family sank into despair again. Part 4. Hope. Alexei's father opens a door to his beautiful apartment in the centre of Ternopil. Its walls are covered with paintings and there are statuettes in the antique bookcase. But Sergei Kordman doesn't pay any attention to the artworks. He crosses the room hastily to some boxes piled up against the wall. They're parcels to be sent to Alexei and his fellow captives. He opens up some of them to reveal toothbrushes, socks, old shoes with no laces, tinned food, and other stuff that the prisoners are allowed to get from home. He had heard some rumours about a big prisoner swap at the end of the year, but didn't expect anything to come of it. The previous disappointments were too heartbreaking. Serhi said he would wait until next year, and if nothing happened again, he would go to Kiev and stay near the parliament until the issue of the prisoners was solved. Miles away, sitting in her tiny studio, Alyona shared his scepticism. She glanced at the icons in the entrance to her apartment, and knew she wouldn't believe any promises until she knew her brother was on his way home. Then, on December the 27th, the Ukrainian army and the Russian-led forces carried out a large exchange of prisoners, the first in more than 24 months, releasing 73 Ukrainian soldiers from captivity. Alexei Kodman and Mykola Iovov were among them. After more than two years, the families reunited. But dozens of other Ukrainian soldiers remain in captivity and there are no guarantees that their stories will have a happy ending.